Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. (laughs) And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators, although we don't always pay attention. And we've all taught illustration at universities. Together, we've got about 70 books between us, and we've all, I think I got that out of order. Yeah, it's good. Something. Yeah. Okay, Lee. <laughs> Each week we take questions from you, our trusty listeners, uh, and we hash it out in the octagon. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you're gonna learn something brand new. Yeah. I wanna say if this in our first like twenty episodes, maybe even eighty episodes, if we had done this, we would have been like, let's start over. Let's re-record but now. That. We realize but... how boring it is to, to hear the same thing every time. So we know that you guys, some of you are looking for the mess up. And so we give you what you want. There you go. It's like the, it's like yeah. the dollar bill that got printed with the face upside down or something, right? Yeah. The yeah. You want, you want that <laughs> for sure. Well, we got some questions going on here. Also, uh, the last couple episodes we've been interviewing people. I hope you guys are liking that. Um, it's definitely been fun for us. Definitely been fun for us. So yeah. we'll keep it's that coming. A little bit of a change up. And if there's anybody you want to hear um, on Three Point Perspective, uh, let us know. We'll try to get them. Uh, you could send us an email on the um, on the Three Point Perspective page over at svslearn.com. Just send us an email there and say, "Oh, I've always wanted to hear, hear this person." And, who who uh, is yeah uh, between for you guys if you could just snap your fingers and we can get any guest on mm. yeah that's an artist not an obviously celebrity or something like that but who who would you pick for an for an art interview dead or alive yeah <laughs> oh that's a good let's do both Norman Rockwell okay yes wouldn't that no. be fun I don't know that'd be great to like hire a um like a voice actor. And have them research, like read a biography on Norman Rockwell or something, and then interview them and have them pretend to be Norman Rockwell. <laughs> what if we do that as a Halloween one? We set it up as us doing a seance, and then Norman Rockwell comes in the room, and we do the interview. I, I like it. I yeah. like it. We'll you know who I wouldn't Halloween. mind having would be Lane Smith. Okay. Why do you Why I, do you say I, that? He, he, I just I've always been a fan. I'd be fanboying a little bit, yeah. you know, I just, cool. just would like to, uh, it might not be that the best interview because it might not, he might not be, well, I mean, he's, he's been, he's such a big name in illustration. Um, it's, it would be more of like a retrospective cause yeah, there's cause, no way to get the perfect person. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'd pick because, Mary Grand Prix. Oh Yeah. She could, love to she's her. interesting for two reasons. She, she's interesting because she ha, had what happened to her is every illustrator's that's it's sort of the home run at the bottom of the ninth of the World Series. What she did. I mean, no, mm-hmm. who gets that where you put out a product? Covers, yeah, you put out yeah. a product and it's so big that it that it's it's bigger than you. It's bigger than almost the industry. I mean, it yeah. was crushing success or I don't know. That's not yeah. the right adjective. But um. But then she she quits illustration, and it then goes, goes in into fine art, and I mean that is an interesting hour right there. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be really cool, because it's like it was good timing too, because she was like developed as an illustrator. She mm-hmm. didn't like roll up right. to those book covers and be like, "Oh, uh, let's see, let's figure this out." You yeah, know? she wasn't new. Yeah. That'd be cool. I would go, I'd want to interview someone in the comics realm. So I think it'd be cool to interview Mike Mignola um, and talk to him. And you know, if you did that, it would probably be smarter to cut Lee and I out and get someone like Scotty Young to help you. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Because I I I can't ask questions of, I don't know comics. But he's, uh, I mean, you could do a little research leading up to it. It might be interesting to hear someone outside of it. It would be fun. I just would feel like I I was sitting at a table that I didn't really belong at in some ways. Oh. Uh, well, you always belong. You do. <laughs> Group hug. At the table. Group I know hug. What to okay, the so table. I'll, I'll, I won't do comics then. If I were to interview uh, an illustrator, it'd be cool. It's, maybe this is realistic. It'd be cool to talk to Sean Tan. Oh, now that's... Mm. 
you know that would be fun yeah he'd be he'd be really fun to talk to i think yeah. so but it'd be hard not to go your work is so good all right lane smith sean tan mary grand prix let's have a little contest who can get our dream artist let's go ahead and try is to it, tra- what if i get mary grand prix you can't and go Mike after Mike. I'm, you can't go I'm after Mike. I'm going to go after all three. <laughs> <laughs> Each one of them get an, an email from one of us. <laughs> They're just like, but these guys disregard leave me Jake's, alone. <laughs> disregard Jake's email. Uh, I've reached out to two illustrators that haven't gotten back to me yet. And uh, um, I think they might be either... I'm thinking they're just too busy. They haven't even opened my email yet. They're not. What, what if? Me. What if, if if people don't respond to us, we like publicly shame them on the podcast? So <laughs> that's one way to do it. <laughs> that's one way to get someone on. <laughs> we bully them into being here. <laughs> we publish our list. <laughs> one is a Calicut Honor winner, and she, um, I think I'm gonna have to go through her agent or. Or some, I tried to email her directly, but all right. The second could, challenge will be who can get anybody associated with the Calicut on here. Mm. Honor, honor, or full winner, 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 chicken dinner. Either way. Okay. Okay. First person okay. to get somebody who has won a Caldecott or an honor or who has read a Caldecott book. Mm. (laughs) all right we're drinking let's get to these questions come on wait one last thing one last thing one last thing before we get to that this is our last episode of 2021 so i just want to say looking back at this year of of podcasting and everything that we've done do you guys have any like takeaways or any like anything from doing this i mean we're just talking about how um we we started this podcast sort of, mm-hmm. it wasn't on a whim. It was more like, let's, let's do this. But do you guys have any insights from 2021 that you're like carrying you with carrying with you? into? I don't, I don't know if this is specific to 2021, but one thing that I've, I've learned from when we started answering questions is um, to a couple of things. People are basically all artists are going through the same thought processes because we see a lot of the same questions over and over again. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. We answer the same questions sometimes. And and sometimes hopefully we, we bring a little bit diff, different um, takes to that information. Um, but uh, the other, the other side of it is that uh, we're all, I think as artists, a lot of us are starving to, to connect. And the, a lot of the letters that we get are, they start out with, it's fun listening to you guys because it's like, hanging out with Mm -hmm. other, you know, like-minded people in my studio as I work. Mm -hmm. And that just always makes me feel great. When I, when I started this business, you know, there was no internet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was just, it was in its infancy. And I would call other illustrators just to hear someone else's voice that was going through the same thing. I would just randomly call an illustrator from the workbooker showcase, which the internet totally took those source books Mm -hmm. out. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I, and just just have a, and they'd be like, "Who's this?" They'd be all excited because they thought I was giving them a job. Because when your phone rings, you're all back in the day, <laughs> your phone would ring, and it could be, you know, a, another job. And so, hello, this is so and so. Yeah, this is just another illustrator. Who would like to. <laughs> they say were probably hi. grateful, grateful to hear it too. No, some of them were, them. and others were kind of like, "Okay, you're new out of school. All right, I'll talk to you for a few minutes." Mm -hmm. (laughs) well building on that i guess my takeaway is uh things constantly evolve and watching and 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 going through this we're still evolving we we just added a different kind of format where with the interviews we're going to a weekly it's just fun to see how the industry evolves how things kind of meander and then all of a sudden you're doing a whole separate project based on how things slightly shift and ebb and flow. And so it's kind of fun. I've kind of um, given myself to that process instead of trying to control everything in my career so tightly, just like this podcast, it sort of just evolves on its own. And if you just let it kind of fan out there and, 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 and do what it wants to do, then you find what's, what's sort of right for you. And so I'm trying to listen to that a little more. Yeah. Can I follow up with one thing from earlier in the year with you, Lee? Sure. Whatever happened to your NFT? 
that you put up? <laughs> I want to love you, NFT. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny how like that was such a, a big like kind of thing going on in the art world at the beginning of the year. And now it's like, I don't want to say I told you so really. No, it's like, no, there's no, I told you so the NFTs are still a thing. They're NFTs still a thing, but I, I, I feel like, I feel like they, uh, they ran their, their course a little bit. They it was like fidget course. spinners. Well, it's like anything that gets overhyped. It's going to, it's going to calm down and reach an equilibrium. Yeah, so they're it's here to stay. I'm sorry to say, Lee. <laughs> 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 All right. I disagree. <laughs> All right, first question for today. Um, this comes in from Rochelle, and she says, "Hello, everyone. I love your podcast so much. I binge it." Hold on. Her uh, subject line for this was was really good. To Adobe or not to Adobe? <laughs> so. Nice. Um, I love your podcast so much. I binge it, even listening to episodes more than once and learning something new every time. Get it, Lee? She's mm-hmm. a little shout out to you. Something brand spanking new. Um, I've learned so much, even if I know I don't want to be a children's book illustrator. That's valuable in and of itself, too. Like, just knowing that this isn't a path you necessarily need to follow is is super valuable. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard this question a million times, but no matter how many previous episodes I listened to, I can't tell if you've already talked about it. Do you need to learn Photoshop or not? I am more comfortable with a couple of other programs, mainly Krita, since it's good for painting and I don't do much photo editing. But I know if I put the time slash effort in, I can learn to use Photoshop eventually. The question is, should I put in the time and effort? Perhaps the answer differs based on what path I take. As an aspiring concept artist, I feel that most people say Photoshop is the industry standard. I hear a lot of different takes from inside and outside the industry. What are your guys' thoughts? Thank you. And I cannot wait for the next episode, Rochelle. What do you guys think? Necessary, not necessary? I want Have Lee to answer first this? so I can contradict him. <laughs> well, one thing I want to thank Rochelle for is that she actually, uh, what, what's the word, phonetically spelled out her name after the name because yeah. we butcher so many people's names. So I appreciate that. Rochelle? Rochelle. <laughs> Rochelle. <laughs> Rochelle. Um, I say uh, that it is absolutely essential to learn Photoshop. Um, and the reason I say that is because, well, all of those painting programs have a certain amount of similarity. And depending on how you're using them, you can learn them pretty quick. Like I never used Procreate before, but when I got it on my iPad, uh, it was you know, five minutes of learning. Oh, there's a brush. There's how I make a layer. Yeah. There's my erase tool. It was All awesome. the, the, the fundamental principles of, of the app are the same across yeah, all it's, these apps. It's super easy if you're just a basic painter. But the power of Photoshop in its image editing abilities is so much higher, like using an overlay uh, layer to control lights and darks, like these like subtle things. I don't want to get into even what that is, but how I use a lot of, um, how I use Photoshop now specifically is my whole layer is filled with just a flat texture for the most part. And then I'm actually painting on a mask and that's what's showing through to the illustration. And that way I can switch out the texture without actually repainting anything. And so I don't want to get over the technical, but you cannot do, at least not without effort, um, how I'm painting now in another program as mm-hmm. easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, unfortunately, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, one, it's one of those things where I think if you, I don't know how old she is, but the younger you are, the if. You're you're just put, you're basically delaying the inevitable. Eventually, you're going to probably have to learn it. I mean, mm-hmm. um, it, it is so powerful, and you can do you can recreate any traditional look in Photoshop, except maybe uh, it, it doesn't have an advanced watercolor engine or oil engine. And if that, if you're looking to do specifically rich buttery oils. You'll probably have a hard time, a harder time doing that in Photoshop. But, but or, painter and and there's another there's a watercolor program I use that that has the watercolor engine and it's like incredible. Art Rage or something like that. Oh, not Art Rage. It's called. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll find it in just a minute. It's it, I don't use it a ton, but when I need it, it is absolutely essential. It actually has bleeding effects and all that stuff um, mm. on high resolution images. But all that stuff plays well with Photoshop. So you go over to right. that thing, get Whatever. what you need, and bring it back in. 
whatever happened to that Adobe project they unveiled out at Adobe Max uh, when we were Canvas there? Canvas or some? Or Canvas. It was for the iPad and had a, a really cool water brush engine. Yeah, it's still, I mean, it's an app you can download and it's pretty cool and you can use it. Okay, so, but yeah. would you guys, if you were trying to do watercolors digitally, would you use one of those apps and then edit that in Photoshop? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's like, really the way to go, right? Is Yeah. Is it, you, you're going to always end up in Photoshop, whether you're managing your images, yeah, that's right. um, you know, I adjusting would, your images. I would just work your way, get get to know, um, you know, the, the 20% essential needs for Photoshop, which is you're going to want to go under the, um, the filter layer and just kind of look at what all those different filters do, because sometimes those help. Um, in, in, you know, adding, I'm, 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 I actually am worried now. Don't get too crazy with the filters, <laughs> but like, well, but I there's agree certain with things that. you just want to know. Um, and, and there's, there's a, like an ease of use in Photoshop with like prepping your files for print and, and with the way that Photoshop works so well with InDesign, especially if you're going into anything for print. Like those two programs work so well together. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's some good stuff there, but like if you, she was, says she wants to get into concept art, concept design. So again, Photoshop's going to be helpful, um, to like add some polish and some like color, um, color stuff, you know, color adjustment stuff to your mm -hmm. concepts. But I know a lot of artists use, um, uh, Autodesk sketch, what is it called? SketchUp, I think, is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, to to do drawings, I know a lot of people use Clip Studio Paint, which is uh, is like a um, it's a Korean company that that has essentially made it designed to like make comics, but it, it's got some amazing brushes in it. It's got all the layers and stuff like that. Um, what's cool about Clip Studio Paint is you can import import models really easily and pose them. So you could import a model of a of a you know of a, a figure and and put it in the right pose with the right perspective and draw over the top of that to like help your you know help your drawing so um essentially you you're just gonna need to like bite the bullet and learn photoshop but don't yep. I mean, but it's like there's so many tutorials. You're a week away from learning Photoshop, you know. <laughs> and yeah, you, you learn, to learn it, learn it, it in once. your way. Yeah, you learn you, it in your way, what you just need. You don't mm -hmm. need everything in Photoshop. It's a really right. deep program. But yeah, and I might you add don't have too, to learn like, it all at once. You can learn. Yeah. I mean, I learned it over years. I yeah. never took a Photoshop class. I just incorporated a new skill as I needed it. Do you remember right. troubleshooting before YouTube? Like figuring out how to you do stuff. You had to ask a friend. You'd call a friend up. Call a friend. or How do I to, do you'd, this? You'd ask a, a, a forum. You'd go on a forum and like yeah. wait for someone to reply to it. Um, that now, has been such a game changer to be able to yeah. watch. And that's people often uh, send us emails like, why should I go to an art school when I can just look up stuff on YouTube? YouTube is not good for an actual full education. YouTube is good for skill set acquisition that is very, very specific. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. how do I make a soft brush in, or a soft edge in Photoshop or something and then like may, that? And you yeah. may or may not find the video that helps you make the kind of brush you had in, envisioned it doing, you know? Right. But you might. And the other thing about Photoshop is you can't be afraid to experiment because uh, like, like Jake, you know, your soft line thing that you do with inking. Mm -hmm. Where you do some stupid filter thing on top of it, or yeah, and then you flip something and invert something, and, and it looks. Where'd so you good. learn that? I'm screwing around, <laughs> just messing around yeah. in Photoshop. Yeah. I don't even know what you you're know. talking about. I think I need to see this no, flip flop. You don't want to see it. It's dumb. Flip that thing. No, and it's really it. good. It's cool. <laughs> it makes it look almost like a, like it's a, a, an old animation like cell. It does. It's like there's oh, a, oh. a shadow. Yeah, to the like line. a little it's, bit of a shadow, like there's like it's drawn on acetate. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. A, that's a word that we don't say much anymore. I, I will add to. Can I add one more thing? Yeah, go about ahead. this. Um, if they're going to be any of you who are wanting to get into concept art, learn how to use Blender or Maya or one of these three D programs because um, everybody needs every video game and movie is in three D now, and they all need. Um, 
they all need to like make bottles and, and 3D assets off of the stuff you're doing. And so they're going to want to see things from different angles. And if you can just quickly like build up a blocky sort of uh, base for the thing that you're designing, it's going to, it's going to just really help your, your project overall, like the speed at which you get things done. I just got finished with a um, freelance project where we were a team of us were working to design robots and I know a little bit of 3D modeling, but not as much as these other concept artists. And so I would like spend the day doing, you know, six or seven illustration drawings, you know, concept designs for these, for these characters. And then they would post their one model and show it from like 20 different angles. And so it really like, not that the, you know, the client did respond well to my designs. I could offer breadth, but what they were offering was very specific and going in deep and like, here's what is actually going to look like in frame. So, um, you know, if I could do both really easily, that would that would definitely be a clear advantage. And that's what the top tier concept artists are doing at video game companies and for movie for movies. So <clears throat> you're gonna have to learn the stuff to get the, the work. I tell you that the, the scariest YouTube tutorial that I ever do you guys use it a lot for other stuff, like figuring stuff out? I use the a YouTube video for a light relighting my pilot light in this old gas water here mm. in like the depths of an old basement, hundred year old house, old lines, old everything. And I'm watching this guy who's, you know, this old house kind of guy re relighting this pilot light. So I'm underneath this water heater, opening up a gas line and <laughs> lighting this thing. And there's no other <laughs> way to do that, you know, without, yeah. without YouTube. And it, it worked perfectly. Mm, yeah. Terrifying. I got a ukulele and was like, oh, how do I play some songs? And it was just like having someone, <laughs> you know, sitting next to you. Like, here's here's your first starter five songs you can learn on a ukulele. Super Perfect. easy. Perfect. Perfect. I, You know what's funny is anybody over 40 is like, oh, yeah, YouTube. So helpful. Anybody under 40 is just like, guys, come on. Like, <laughs> we were raised on this. <laughs> we know how to use YouTube. <laughs> Uh, okay, next question from Jason. I'm a naughty author. He says, hi, guys. I had my first book published last year. It's a search and find book. I illustrated the book top to bottom. Think Simpsons flat 2D style, and it's gone on to do pretty well. So congrats, Jason. That's a huge uh, accomplishment. The only issue is it's an adult search and find book. It's not too oh, seedy, just a, little, just a little cheeky, if anything. Now I want to get into children's book illustration one day. If I'm ever lucky enough to get to the publication stage, should I consider using a pseudonym? And should I mention my previous book to any future prospecting publishers? Love the podcast, the style, the banter, the advice. You mm. guys rock, Jason. What do you guys think? What should That's what should Jason do? Probably not a bad idea to use a pseudonym. There was an artist that you hit me to, Jake. Those yeah. those delicious, shiny little bubbly you know i can't remember the name of the guy dave cooper yeah yeah and he, he uses a pseudonym right for his yeah so his, stuff? his pseudonym he's he hasn't done a ton of he started doing some children's stuff uh -huh. and i really really only know one book in particular that was published through chronicle um, but he was doing like comics for nickelodeon magazine and for all that kid stuff he used a, a pseudonym called hector mumbly yeah that's hector right. mumbly but if you Google Dave Cooper, you're going to see really graphic cartoon naked ladies. <laughs> Just stuff that might scare the children's book yeah. editor. So, yeah. yeah. So, so maybe that's a good idea. The, the only downside of that pseudonym is it's more work. It's just more work for you to, you know, to do business I, under another name is. Yeah. I think you're going to, Go to an editor or an uh, art director or a or a, an agent, and under your normal name, and just say like, "Hey, here I am. Here's the professional work I've done." Um, but for children's book, I, I'm going to be operating under this name. I mean, Dr. Seuss did it. Um, is Richard Scarry a, a, a pseudonym? I think it I, is. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's not without precedent, and we don't know how many others, you know, people out there working have different names but i think it's cool i think it's a fun way to like brand yourself too like you come up with a fun name like 
you know, uh, Jason jar or something like that. It's like a uh, rhymes with Mason jar, you know, and kids are like, Hey, yeah, you know, I want to read a Jason jar book, you know, it just rolls right off the tongue. There you I go. About that. I don't know about that name, but I'll, I will trust that advice as being that. <laughs> at first I was going to say, no, I would, if it's just one, if it's just one product and that's not who you are, I wouldn't worry about it too much. If that's, if you've identified yourself as the cheeky adult artist, definitely go for the pseudonym but if it's just one yeah. product i don't know yeah probably not a big deal if it's just one but here's the thing um um if that book is not clearly identified as an adult book or geared for adults and somebody loves your children's book a mom she's on amazon and uh she's she wants to see other books by you and she sees that book and orders it and it comes and she hands it to her kid and the kid's like, uh, mom, what's a prostitute? Um, <laughs> you know, or whatever, um, you know, <laughs> you've done a, a, I don't know, probably done a disservice. Maybe not. Maybe that's a, it, it opened up. Maybe a it'll spark a meaningful <laughs> discussion <laughs> at the family dinner oh, table. <laughs> Go with the pseudonym now that now that uh, we've run through this. I'm just By playing way, out a, a, a scenario that is not you know most likely to happen, right? Richard Scurry is not a pseudonym, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Huh. It's funny. It. His last name's Scary, and it's all like children's books. It's like S C A R R Y. Yeah. So you could do Jason Monster, but it's. M O N S S T E R R. That was a family long, name <laughs> from, oh, for two. from Transylvania. And we're very proud of that name, Monster. Yeah. All right. Oh, you get, he got advice from us. I don't know if it's good, some. but he got some. <laughs> All right. Next question. Are, pod, are, are podcasts, are postcards still a thing? Carly Ann asked, last year when the pandemic hit, we were told to hold on, hold off sending postcards to editors and art directors because no one was in the, no one was in the office at the time. So I put those plans on pause. However, it's been a year, and although I don't want to hold on my uh, my hold off my illustration career, I'm pretty sure most of the publishing industry is still working from home. If I want to specifically reach art directors and editors, not agents, what would be the best way to go? Hoping you might have some insight. P.S. Thank you for this amazing podcast and for all you do on SVS Learn. I'm not sure how I would have survived as an illustrator without you three. That was nice. That was Aww. super nice. That last that little cool. bit there. Okay, so uh, I just had a conversation with, with my agent this week, and we were just talking about the landscape of publishing. And she's like, it's so hard for me to get responses from people and people are slow to get back and, and get things going and move things around. And she's like, everyone's still working from home. No one's in an office, um, in Manhattan. Um, I'm sure it's the same out in San Francisco. There's publishing out there. No one's wants to work in an office yet. They've gotten the taste, I think of home life working from home in their pajama bottoms, maybe, I don't know. But, um, yeah, if you send a postcard to all these offices, these random houses and these scholastics and and chronicles and stuff like that, um, they're not going to be seen uh, right away. I'm sure someone comes in, picks up mail, and distributes it to people or something, but um, it might not be the best strategy. What do you guys think? What do you guys well, think? Now, is now would be the time to figure out a way to get their home addresses. No. <laughs> we could make a killing. More bad advice. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Oh, but episode. think about it. I'm, I'm Do not send something to someone's home address. Do not. <laughs> Why not? That is invasive. It's it's just there needs to be a line there. I think I think any art director would find that over. If they the line. see if they're looking for the perfect illustrator for their book, and they see the perfect illustration come in, they don't care that it came to their house. They're like, this is it. This is I'm going to contact this person. Mm, sure, you uh, piss off the other ninety nine. Hundred. Okay, go Will's method if you're if you are a risk taker, and uh, 
And yeah. you hate your career. You hate the idea of doing work with people. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I've I have I have heard editors, and and I'm not I'm not going to advocate that you send it to their home. That that might not be the best idea, unless you can get it to the exact right art director at the right time with the right project who loves your work. But mm-hmm. I have heard editors say, uh, "Don't send me postcards that I." won't publish you know that of work that i don't publish so some people Mm. you know shotgun their work out there right right and uh and and so they'll say well you're sending me the wrong stuff so don't send me a postcard unless it's the right stuff and then the next editor gets up and says well i i published uh i worked with this this new um illustrator you know her name was so and so and it was a beautiful relationship we put out this book and then the questions come in How'd you find him? And then that editor says, well, I had a friend who got a postcard and she couldn't use the art. So she just gave it to me. And that's how I found this, this artist. My, my feeling with postcards, and th- this was, this was how I started my career. So I'm a little biased towards, towards postcards, but I had a lot of stories like that where someone called me and I didn't even email, I didn't mail the postcard to them. I mailed it to another art director who couldn't use it and handed it to some to an art director they knew who might be able to use it. And that's how I got the work. I love the fact that that your work is going out and that someone has to handle it. That's what I love about a postcard is that someone has to deal with it and see it as they throw it away. Um, Whereas it is what it is. I mean, a lot of emails, you just don't know. It's it's really hard to get through the firewalls. I like the postcard. Yeah. I think anybody who gets a postcard likes it for the most part, even if they throw it away, even if it's the one that they don't want. Mm-hmm. I think there's just something about the nature of holding art in your hand mm-hmm. that makes it gather more attention. Um, I think you should send it in. And at, at some point, they'll come back in the office. They're going to have to go through the stuff that's there. I would just I would just keep operating as business as usual. Send out your cards. And, and, and you, like Will said, you never know how or where they're going to end up. This is an interesting problem, though. It really it is. is. I, it, would, it would give me pause to send postcards to an office where people aren't, by and large, showing up. I agree. Well, may, maybe, you, maybe you just get ready for it, like save the budgeting. Because, you know, you, you should have an advertising budget. You know how much you're going to spend. Um, and just hold on to that and just you know, maybe – I don't know, shift gears for the now or, or just keep that money in kind of like a separate fund for when it all comes back. If you mm-hmm. think it's coming back, do you guys think normal life is coming back? I mean, um, I think that, that there are a lot of people who will never go into an office again and their employers are just as happy to have them stay home. Mm-hmm. Um, so things have definitely changed. That's why I think for me, I would err on sending it to their home. I mean, if I, if if I if I could get every art director that I wanted and their home address, I would send it to them. Then I wouldn't care. I, I would I would think this is a piece of art. Yeah. On a postcard, you can throw it away if you want. It's not like it's it's not like I don't see it as invasive. But that's just a that's just probably a different opinion. If they're if they're if they're going to move their office home now, they work at home. Well, that's a good point. I, so while you guys were were jibber jabbing there, whatever it is, <laughs> I um, I went on um, LinkedIn and I just typed in art director, and I just picked I just picked uh, one publisher, I won't say who, and right then it gave me three art directors for that publisher, and you click on their name and it says contact info. And right there, it takes me to their website. I go on their website. It says email, you know, message me. I clicked on that. And right there, I can just email that person directly. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a really killer portfolio website, um, you know, I would look at their work first to make sure your work that you're doing matches sort of their, what they're doing. Like one of these art directors clearly does, you know, like fiction adult novels, right? And so if you've got children's book style stuff and you mm. send it to her, she's not going to 
respond to that. She's going to stick that in the trash. But if you found someone who does the children's book stuff, send them that. Like that's one way to do it. And mm-hmm. uh, and and it was it was easy. I mean, it took me two minutes to like track these people down. And if you had an all, all afternoon, you could easily get the emails of you know, 500, mm-hmm. not 550. <laughs> I, I, I've told the story where, where me and a friend, I mean, on this podcast, where a friend and a, a friend of my, a friend and I went for a week to the public library to get physical addresses to send postcards to. Mm-hmm. The, the, this, what you're talking about, Jake, is much easier than we did. I mean, we yeah. spent a good 30 to 40 hours one week, both of us, so man hours, double that. And, and we ended up with, I think, 1100 names. And, uh, so the, you really do have, when you have the internet on a device in your home, there really aren't any excuses for not being able to take some time out. And the resistance from the war of art will be telling you the whole time you're wasting your time. You're not going to get anything from this. You could be playing a video game right now. You could be watching your show. Why are you doing this? And yep. yet it's the people that do things like this that are creative that will will make a career for themselves. That's true. And the one thing I want to stress here is there's different kind of mailing lists for different times and, and different reasons. And, you know, for some of the stuff, like you guys are talking about getting – Email list that's a little bit different than the questions asking for. So we email list doesn't cost you much. That should be like kind of a broad list. But to do what Will's saying, like find out where they work now, whether that's at home, maybe they, I don't know, whatever. Um, there's a benefit to having a very curated, small, custom list that you know these people, you know exactly what they what they're looking for, what kind of books they publish, what kind of art they like. You know, maybe it's a, a list of twenty to twenty five people. And that's what I would focus on, making sure they get some kind of handheld thing, a piece of artwork, mm-hmm. something that you made, whatever. But I, it doesn't have to be a huge media blast. And I think it's just important to understand the difference between a broad mailing list and a custom, small, curated mailing list. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would For you sure. would you guys, going back to the email thing, would you get creative with the subject mat, the subject line? Like, don't open unless you like children's art or something provocative to – to yeah, like you know, like like based on will terry my subject line would say i know where you live <laughs> <laughs> and if and if you don't open this email you're going to start getting postcards <laughs> <laughs> one you know 50 bucks will get me to go away <laughs> <laughs> one job and i'll never email you again um, right. um, i would I, I you know i'd play it straight it's would you? be professional Boring. and you could have a little personality in there maybe, but you, you know, I'd maybe keep the, keep the, the subject line like mildly provocative, but not cheeky. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Like I wouldn't say your next great hire is right. in this. Don't, email. don't oversell yeah. yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I would be like, um, um, maybe something like children's book illustrator looking for work. Yeah, that's about, too generic. About, I would reference <clears throat> the artwork that you're putting in there and then some kind of like curious kind of tagline to, yeah. to pique their interest. So, but yeah, related about, to what's in the email. I love, I love what you've published and I think that my work could, could match, you know, or could, could enhance your next book or something. You might say, I think we'd be great working together. Yeah portfolio you could, inside you could be cheeky and say we these could are all really long subject titles beautiful music together or beautiful artwork together you sound like a boomer putting that long <laughs> that long of a here's here's the title. title uh capital r lowercase e colon um sorry i missed the meeting and <laughs> and then they're like no. wait what what was the meeting and what reply <laughs> open it <laughs> <laughs> it'll All definitely right. get opened or because because you missed the meeting yeah yeah where were you this All afternoon right. question mark question mark question mark <laughs> because you missed our call things not to do That's yeah point perspective. things not to do this is our bad advice episode <laughs> it's, 
That's what we're doing it. Right now, someone's like, this episode, every episode, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last question, and we'll, we'll get out of here. We got stuff to do. Will's got an appointment, and uh, I have to do real work here. So, Laura says, how personal is too personal? Hey, uh, hey guys, thank you for this podcast. Y'all keep me entertained on long drawing painting days, and I love listening. Great stuff. Again, thank you so much for that nice compliment. My question, how personal is too personal on personal projects? Here's the context. I've been writing and illustrating a webcomic lately that is very autobiographical. However, in the past year, my family has experienced some heavy stuff. Weirdly, my most inspired work comes from uh, truly personal experiences. I feel like I nail expression and visual storytelling when images are related to my own life experience. I've had what I think is a great idea for a picture book dealing with grief, but... As it is informed by my own child's grief, I certainly don't want to capitalize at her expense. Also, would stakeholders in the industry find it deeply find deeply personal work indulgent? Perhaps this is a mute point, as I'm not sure my work is ready for professional publishing anyhow. Have any of you created images that are directly related to your own personal experiences, and have those images or projects been successful, or have you regretted sharing very personal experiences with the world? What do you guys think? And you can see a link to her. You guys see that link to her stuff, so you can see, see what that. level it is. I mean, She's, I've always uh, advocated on on going into niche markets. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's nice. Work. I don't I, understand the question. I need to. I mean, that was a long. Yeah, it was a long question. Essentially, what it is is like, um, I want to do a children's book based on grief specifically an experience that my daughter had mm -hmm. but she feels w w maybe it's like a little weird to to bring her into it this much like to be yeah that it's that specific too, well she yeah. could she could change her doesn't she didn't have to mention that it was her daughter's experience but the experiences are real and the problems are real and there are other parents with kids that are having the same problems and that's really where Mm -hmm. where going into a niche market is um, advantageous as an illustrator and also very helpful to a certain community. Um, um, a story, and I'm, I'm sure I've told this on the podcast before, but we had a student at svslearn.com um, who, whose son got, I, I don't want to say the disease because I, I don't, it's too I don't know specific. if she wants me to, and, uh, but anyway, got a, a, a form of cancer went through the whole hospital thing and got counseling from the hospital and they handed him a book when they went in there and the and the the nurses said we're apologizing in advance for this book but we have to give it to you cuz it's it's our protocol and it's uh here you go and it's like you have cancer you're you might die kind it's like very very mm. matter of fact and harsh and not well done there's mm -hmm. no there wasn't really a story but it was like made in, into like a children's book oh boy. for kids you know and Oof. so she she saw this thing and she was like that is harsh and it is horrible and i could do something way better than this mm -hmm. so that's that's how she actually found us at svslearn.com to take our classes to become um an illustrator and was working on that that book project i've lost touch with her so i don't know if she ever got it done but, um, you know, her goal was to then uh, publish this book and then be able to approach hospitals and say, look, you can give this one instead of that other <laughs> one, you know. Um, That's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, if it's a real if it's a problem that other people can relate with, why not? There will be there will be publishers if they think that the if the market is too small, you know might might not touch it but 10,000 or or 20,000 or 30,000 books for you as an individual is a nice little mm -hmm. group of, of a, a nice little market to go after you know mm -hmm. so so here, here's what i think if it's autobiographical um you can get as personal as you want because you're talking about yourself and if you want to include people key to your story um I would say get their permission to use their likeness and name. Um, if you don't have that permission, then you have to change those those um, those characters. 
into something else. If it's about your daughter, I don't know if she's, you know, probably not old enough to give permission. So I would definitely not do a book specifically about her, but it could Mm -hmm. be about, think of it this way, like write the book that she needs to read and she doesn't need to read something about herself exactly. She needs to read about somebody else going through what she's, what she's gone through. And she'll be happy to learn later on that it was, that it's her. And that way, it's very personal. It's based on personal experiences, but it's not, you know, specific. And I think about like one of the most popular books ever in graphic novels is Smile by Raina, Raina Tengemeyer, right? And she based that on her own experience growing up with her problems with, uh, you know, going to the dentist and teeth problems. And that's why it resonates so what, with so many people, because other people have gone through that. She tells it in a very compelling and personal way. It's very open. Um, and so, um, you know, there's, you can get really personal in that regards, but she had permission, I, I assume from family members to include them in the book. Um, and, uh, and it was about herself. So she was, you know, just comfortable to share what she's comfortable. So that, those are like the guidelines I would think. And then as far as like publishers being turned off by things being too personal, um, I think as long as you're doing it in a respectful, tasteful way, and it's something like that people can get, like people, you know, can understand uh, not being an exhibitionist, but being like, I'm sharing this in a spirit of um, help, you know, like I want to help and I want people to be able to improve their lives from this, you know, then I think it, I think you're all right. I don't know, Lee, you've been kind of quiet. What do you think? I'm just waiting for you guys to wrap up <laughs> long winded answers. Um, I think, I think about uh, immediately with this question, I think about um, Dan Santet's book after the fall, which was mm-hmm. about his, I, I believe, if I remember correctly, it, it's about his wife overcoming anxiety. And so... Oh, I, I thought it was about him being an egg once. Yeah. And like it, turning it into a bird. It was autobiographical. <laughs> 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 no, but for real, it's, it's her, it's about her relationship with anxiety. And, and, um, and then he did, he, he, you know, wrote this book in this, in this really creative way and he made it his own and it's not embarrassing to her i'm sure i'm sure he got the permission from her to tell everybody about why that book was written and Mm -hmm. and you know to to when he's talking about you know the making of the book that she was the inspiration of it but um but you know his wife isn't in the book and and her anxiety isn't front and center in the book and so i think there's always a creative way to approach this and i think you should approach this because there's nothing more boring than going through the motions of being an artist um, and just drawing things because you happen to be able to draw something realistically or representational or, or mm-hmm. paint and color well. All that's pretty good. But at, at the end of the day, those are just forgettable images. What people remember is these powerful stories and things that we're connected to. And that's what makes a good book is is these relationships to these topics and, and um, maybe not knowing how to explore it. So you're going to come up with something creative because you have to. Um, you know, nobody needs to see another drawing of a, of just, just a, a head or, or a study of a hand or something like that. At a certain point, you gotta, you gotta make something that means something. And it sounds like this will be the book for you. Yeah. Can I give my hot take on Dan Santet and after the fall? You sure. For this? Hot so take. I think Beekle is a great book and definitely deserved its Caldecott award, but I think after the fall is ten times better than Beagle. I like it better too. Wow. Right? Okay. And I think I that one on should that. have got the Caldecott. And I think that um, I think that had they been reversed, had he done that one first, um, it would have it would have gotten the award and not Beagle. Hmm. Interesting. I agree well, with you. But it's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous on the committee book. for that year. Mm-hmm. The, the Dan committee. had been had been building up some momentum, I think, for that call to cut for a while, and yeah. he's on everybody's radar, and it just happened to hit with Beagle. But I agree with you; if they, if they were reversed, he probably would have got it for that one too. Yeah. yeah, yep. So there we go. I think that's it for today, guys. Um, awesome. Th- Wrap yeah. it up. Thanks for joining us. Three Point Perspective is brought to you by SVSLearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. 
Your hosts today have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. Uh, Will Terry's work can be found online at willterry.com and on Instagram at willterryart. Lee White's work can be found online at leewhiteillustration.com and on Instagram at leewhiteillo. And my work can be found online at mrjakeparker.com and on Instagram at jakeparker. Special thanks to everyone who helps us get this podcast going and, and keeps the lights running and the engine purring here at um, the Three Point Perspective Podcast Studios, aka svslearn.com. So special thanks goes to, that's a big lead up for, has, here we go. Has, wait, has the SVS engines ever really purred? You know, it's, 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 uh, that's, that's being very generous. <laughs> 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 Very generous. No. Okay. Who who's who's helped us here? Our podcast producer, Daniel Two. You can find him at Daniel2.co. Um podcast, not podcast, our SVS Learn uh production manager, producer guy. He is David Bro. And a special thanks to him for all that he does. And a special thanks to Lisa Fott for all of the administrative work she does behind the scenes at SVSLearn.com. Thank you for that. Um if you like this episode and you want to join in on the conversation, please join us over at the, the forum for the svslearn.com forum. You can um, log in over there, find the topic devoted just to this uh, episode, and 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 just let us know what you think. If you, you disagree with our answers or if you have something to say that you didn't um, want to say, you could do that. You can also go on youtube.com and uh, search for for our podcast on there and you'll find um you know this episode on youtube as well which is kind of cool okay uh anything else i think that's it leave a review on itunes and um we'll see you guys next time bye bye